So I have, I have no financial uh, disclosures to report. We do have clinical support for Palm from both uh, Olympus America and Irby. And uh, I'm going to show some videos, and my friend Dr. Kevin Revis was kind enough to supply them because they're very vivid uh, and illustrative videos. So I do want to give him a uh, thank you for that. So POEM, as you know, was described by Professor Inouye in 2010. Uh, it was used to describe an endoscopic treatment for achalasia, an alternative to uh, myotomy. The idea came from the experience from ESD, from malignant tumors of the G junction stomach and esophagus. But uh, to some degree, it was inspired by NOS as well. Um, and the original reports in an animal model came from Pazricha a few, earlier, uh, a few years earlier. And this first seminal paper had its first 17 cases of achalasia. So just to review the steps of the poem, uh, after doing endoscopy and measuring length of the esophagus and the location of the GE junction, a mucosal opening is made. We then create a submucosal tunnel down past the GE junction onto the wall of the stomach. A myotomy is then done of the circular muscle of the esophagus, and that goes through the GE junction onto the proximal stomach. And then typically we irrigate the tunnel with antibiotics, although I'm not sure we have definitive data on whether or not that's necessary. Uh, and then mucosal closure is achieved with some of the endoscopic cliffs you saw in the previous talks. It manages the poem, leaves the esophagus and the G junction anatomically undisturbed. Uh, it may help with postoperative gastroesophageal reflux compared to Heller myotomy. That's still under investigation. It is an in situ myotomy, and the length can be tailored to the disease or specifically to high resolution manometric findings. Um, you're not limited by how far up the esophagus you can reach from the abdomen like you are in Heller myotomy. Uh, it could be repeated if it fails in a different part of the esophagus, or it can be used to salvage after failed Heller myotomy. Um, and you're not anatomically limited to just anterior myotomies like you are in a Heller myotomy. And obviously, it's less invasive than, than a full operation. Uh, there are pitfalls. Uh, you can get bleeding in the submucosal tunnel, which you'll see a video of in a minute. Um, although, the advantage of being in a confined space is you can use tamponade to help you stop the bleeding. Uh, perforations can happen. It's actually fairly common to perforate the mucosa. Um, extraluminal perforation is not as common, although when you're below the diaphragm, uh, getting pneumoperitoneum inadvertently is not uh, uncommon. Uh, inability to treat the disease. Sometimes patients that have been previously dilated with a balloon or have been Botoxed or prior hyaluronotomy, there can be severe submucosal fibrosis, which makes creating the tunnel difficult. And uh, then there's some unique and bizarre, which I thought I would share with you today. Um, Dr. Inouye recently presented his first 500 cases, and the complication rate is low. It's 3.2%. And you can see them listed here. I don't need to recount them, but uh, pneumothorax with mediastinal emphysema uh, has occurred, and, and that is something that we need to recognize. Um, you can see mucosal injuries do occur, and uh, sometimes you get a hematoma in the submucosal tunnel. I'm going to show you a unique case of that as well. No mortalities in that series. So uh, this is a, a video of three different types of bleeds. Um, you're going to see here that this is one that's easily handled with a biopsy forceps, similar to what you've heard before. And again, you can see it's a confined space. This is a view of an endoscopic cap over the end of the endoscope, which is typically how we perform palm. And just through the therapeutic channel, of a single therapeutic channel scope, a hot biopsy forceps can get that bleed and stop it. Sometimes it's a little bit of a bigger bleed. Not quite the variceal bleed that Dr. Marsh showed us, but nonetheless, it's a pretty big vessel. And even that, so you can see we're tamponading with the scope a little bit. That gives you time to take a breath and get the tools that you need. Again, we're going to use a biopsy forceps in this video. And an advantage of the endoscopic cap here is it's a little bit more difficult to splash the, uh, the view with the bleeding, so you're more likely to stay in vision. And the biopsy forceps was able to stop it. Um, then you get a really big bleeding sometimes. Now with a little bit of irrigation, you can regain your view. Again, tamponade the bleeder if you can by pushing the scope forward. Still can use the hot biopsy forceps, but you've got to get right on the bleeder. So this is the first attempt failed. Second attempt a little bit more successful, slowing it down a little bit. And they eventually do get control of this. And with the irrigation, they can see that they actually achieved cessation of the bleeding. 
mucosal perforations do happen, so the unintentional mucosotomy uh, is part of what can happen during a pulmonary procedure, and endoscopic clips treat this very effectively. You can see this is an endoscopic view of the luminal side of the perforation. So they're now outside the tunnel looking in the true lumen. That's a retroflex view, and you can see the right at the gastroesophageal junction. And using endoscopic clips, they can clip the mucosal perforation close. Now looking back down the tunnel, you can see that they can inflate air and there's no further perforation. Sometimes, though, it can become even more severe. Uh, this is what uh, Dr. Revis likes to call the Swiss cheese mucosotomy, and <laughs> for obvious reasons. Again, clipping is still effective. Uh, multiple clips adjacent to one another are not technically difficult. In fact, that's how we close the intentional mucosotomy to start the tunnel. And so side-by-side -side clips should very effectively close these. And again, you can see we're in retroflex view. It's right outside the G junction. And sometimes technical difficulties or mishaps can ensue during a case. This is a case that uh, Dr. Swanson and Revis were doing, and the cap became dislodged from the uh, endoscope. So they first tried to grasp it, which would have been the move that I would have employed first, but it was just simply too big. So uh, creatively they thought about passing a Roth net down, again, good, having good knowledge of all your endoscopic tools is very helpful in this situation. That didn't work. We went to the jumbo forceps. That, that didn't work. They tried rat tube forceps. Almost grabbed it, but not quite. Finally, they used the biliary extraction balloon to go distal to the balloon to the, to the cap, inflated the balloon, and then they were able to pull the cap back towards the scope and retrieve it. And that beautiful video, which is about a minute and a half long, took about an hour and a half of ingenuity to be able to get that cap back. So mishaps like this can uh, be very difficult to handle. Uh, Pone can fail, although it's rare, it can. Severe submucosal fibrosis can limit the ability to do it. Um, you can't distend the submucosa and create a tunnel. Uh, when you try to do it with the mucosa, it continually rips further distally as you're trying to start the tunnel. Um, we had a case where the patient, unbeknownst to us, had Botox injected by someone else 10 days before the procedure, and we were not able to perform the procedure. It was just simply too inflamed and fibrotic. Um, and we, at that time, decided to abandon the case and come back and do a hyaluronotomy. And now for a couple of the wow, I didn't see that coming. This is called uh-oh, so uh, we had an uh-oh, and I want to share it with you. Um, we were doing a poem, and we had just started on the myotomy. And uh, it's important to not pass the needle knife or the hybrid knife through the full thickness of the esophagus. Well, we did, and we made a tiny little pinhole in the pericardium. Now, as you're performing this procedure, you're inflating carbon dioxide, but unbeknownst to us, we were inflating it into the pericardium, we actually caused the tension cap in the pericardium and caused cardiac arrest. Um, by absolute luck, we had an anesthesia change, and just as the new anesthesiologist walked in the room, she saw the rhythm change, and right away alerted us to the problem, we realized that the patient was in distress. Uh, we did get him back with CPR, obviously we had to abort the procedure, and uh, he actually healed fine with no deficits, and three months later went on to have a myotomy. But that chest x-ray uh, tells the story, and we just published this case so that everyone can be aware of this potential dreadful uh-oh of complication. We had another case which was fascinating. Um, we had a Nigerian man who was five years after a uh, myotomy and uh, had recurrent symptoms and monometry confirmed type 2 achalasia. So we performed a posterior myotomy, he went uneventfully, and he did pretty well. Ten days postoperatively, he went to a family reunion in Pennsylvania, and he ate fufu, which is a new food to me. Um, but basically, it's, it's dipped in soup and swallowed whole without chewing. Um, the act of doing this created a large hemorrhage in the submucosal tunnel, and he actually presented to the hospital with acute upper GI bleeding. He ended up getting helicoptered to a tertiary care center. Unfortunately, they had someone familiar with Palm and uh, nude managed it conservatively because it did stop on its own and uh, he improved. 
But, you, you know, know, I wanted, wanted to find out what, what Foo Foo was, and I, I looked it up on the internet, and uh, I found this very valuable lesson <laughs> of food to never eat after having a palm procedure, and I actually showed this to the patient, so he promised me no more Foo Foo, we shouldn't have this problem. So, so some closing thoughts, uh, you know, know, early literature on palm does show that it's safe and uh, effective as laparoscopic heller myotomy. Um, typically, you can manage your complications through the endoscope, but some ingenuity may be required. Um, surgeons that do palm need to be familiar with a wide variety of endoscopic tools because you may need them. And uh, fortunately, complications are relatively rare and they are seldomly life-threatening. And at that point, I will stop. Thank you very much. And uh, we will begin our Q&A with our panel. So thank you.